Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. Today I'd like to show you the first game I ever played against a master. So let's set up the situation. Um, I've been playing tournament chess for 18 months. I have my rating up to 1676. And I'm playing in an open section in a big tournament in Philadelphia. And the reason I'm playing in the open section is that's the only section they had. Everybody from beginner and unrated players all the way up to the best players in Philadelphia are all in one big section. And in those days, the ratings were much, much lower. Uh, the rating system has the same curve to it, the same look. But as it rates more and more players, the curve gets bigger and bigger. And it pushes the people at the end away from the median. So the median rating is set up to be about 1,500 with a 200-point standard deviation. So when it's rating a much lower number of players like we were in those days, the curve is much smaller, so the number of people over 2,200 is much smaller than it is today. So they haven't changed the barrier for where master is, but the number of people playing are much greater, so the curve is much bigger, and there's a lot more people over the master level. So in those days, there was only one active master in the Philadelphia area, and his name was Sergei Garigliad, and he was rated 2242, and he was playing in this tournament, and he, of course, was the number one rated player. And with 102 people in the first round, number one plays number 52, number two plays number 53, and so on. And with my rating of 1676, I happen to be number 52. So this is the first round. And I got paired with Sergey. Now my friend Lester Shelton saw the pairing and he said to me, oh Dan, what a shame you got paired against the master. If you had a, your rating was a few points higher, you would have played the lowest unrated. And instead you got to play the master and he's going to kill you. And I said to, Sergei, I said to Lester, I said, Les, I can't worry about that. I said, I'm just going to do what I always do. I'm going to look at the board, make the best move I can. And after the game, if I tried my best on every move, I'll look myself in the mirror and say I did the best I could. And if he beats me, which he probably will because he's a master, I, I won't feel bad about it because I did the best I could on every move. And I tell this to my students, you know, when my students, you know, they're so used to these sections today where it's under 1,400, or under 1,600, that if they play in a tournament where they're 1,340 and I have to play someone 1,550 that normally wouldn't even be in their section, they're like, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose and here I am, I'm rated 1676, and I'm playing at 2242, and I'm not expecting to win, but I'm not afraid of my opponent. I'm not, you know, worried about going into the game and, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? I'm just going into the game, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to play my best on every move, and if I get a result, I get a result, but I'm not going to be afraid of my opponent. That's crazy. You know, I'd be afraid of my opponent if he was, you know, brandishing a knife or something, but I'm... <laughs> If he's playing a chess game, the worst that's going to happen is I'm going to lose. But if I try my best on every move, I'm going to be okay. All right, so in those days, I was playing the Black Mar D Mar Gambit, which looks something like this. D4, D5, E4, D takes E4, Knight C3, Knight F6, F3. Or if they play Knight F6 on the first move, you can still play either F3 or Knight C3. If you play Knight C3, threatening... But, e4, the only way to stop that is to play d5. If they play any other move, like d6, they're in a Pierce defense. But if they play d5, you could still play e4. If they take with the pawn and you go here, it's the same position. And they have the option here of taking with the knight and getting into something like this. So that's the Black Mar D Mar Gambit, and I was playing that right at this time. So I played d4 against the master, hoping to play the black mar d mar gambit. And what does he do? He plays the Dutch. Well, I was an e4 player up until I played the black mar d mar gambit. So I didn't know anything about the Dutch except what I had read in annotated master games. And I remembered the one thing that they re recommended in annotated master games, which was Fianchetto against the Dutch. So I played g3, and uh, that's about all I knew about <laughs> the book opening was play g3. All right, so Sergei plays the Leningrad Dutch against me with g6. The, the main Dutch is to play e6. I play bishop g2, knight f6, c4, bishop g7, knight c3, castle. All right, so this was kind of a, a, to be expected. And now I wanted to play a move that was logical, but yet looked like it might be a little non-booky. Well, I succeeded, and I didn't succeed at the same time. I thought maybe knight h3 would take my opponent out of the book a little bit, 
and still give me a chance to control these light squares in the center and get my knight up to a square which might be very good against this pawn structure. But to my surprise after the game, when I looked it up in MCO 10, you know, just like in the Queen's Gambit when Beth every night is reading MCO 9 uh, in, you know, in, in the video of the Queen's Gambit, uh, when I went back and looked this up in MCO 10, Knight H3 was the only move considered in MCO 10 in this position. So when I found that out, I said, oh my goodness, I must be getting to be a better player because I didn't know the book and I played a move that looks a little strange and yet it's the only move that was even considered in the book. It's not necessarily the number one move now if you give it to an engine, but that was the only move in MCO 10 at Knight H3. All right, Sergei plays D6. I play Castle. He plays C6. And now I play a little bit of a strange move. I move my knight twice with the idea of playing E4 here. And uh, if I can get him to play h6, I'm going to play knight f3, knight h4, and go after the weak pawns on the, on the light squares. All right, so knight g5, probably not the best move. I think uh, Rib Stockfish 14 says my best move is <clears throat> to play either b3 or the, the typical move you play in... Dutches to play d5. d5 is a very typical Dutch move. I think I knew that when I was playing this game. I'm not sure. All right, so I play knight g5. Sergei expands with e5. I trade pawns. I'm not worried about trading queens here. My end game should be okay. And besides, the master doesn't want to go into the end game with me here. So I play e4, which is the typical break against that kind of position. Okay, and Sergei says, let me remove the guard with h6. And now I play knight f3. I'm not worried about ha him having two pieces on this pawn. Because if he takes it, I just keep taking until he takes with a pawn. And then I can play something like knight h4, attacking g6 and e4. And I'm going to get one of my, I'm going to get my uh, piece back here. He could play bishop f5 to hold it temporarily, but... I'm going to be able to attack the e-pawn more times and win it. So, so I play knight f3, and Sergei doesn't want to trade queens. He plays queen c7. That's probably not the best move. Uh, Ribka, which I analyzed with this first recommended, queen takes d1, and thinks the position would be relatively even. So now I think white has an advantage. I move my knight again. I tell my students not to do this. I move my knight now one, two, three, four times in the opening. But already I have a really good game. It's a little bit like that Eliakin Rubinstein game I had in the earlier video where Eliakin broke a lot of the opening principles and got a good position. Uh, normally you don't do that. And that's what Eliakin said in that game. He says, don't take this game as how I normally play. All right, so I play knight h4. Sergei plays king h7. But now I can play pawn takes, pawn takes, queen c2. And now Sergei has almost no choice. He has to play e4 at some point. And then his pawns are going to be very rigid. They're going to be easily blockaded. And they're going to be targets. So he plays e4. I develop the bishop with tempo. Bishop f4. I think the engine wants me to play f3 right away there and break up the pawns. Queen f7 hitting my pawn here. Now here I made a beginner mistake. You know, when you make a move and your opponent makes a move... You don't just say, oh, I know why he made that move. He made that move because I was attacking his queen and he had to move it. You have to ask yourself, what are all the things that move does? Well, that move not only saves the queen, but it attacks my pawn on c4. And I have to admit that I blundered here by not seeing that he was attacking the pawn on c4. And yet the move I made was a very good move, sacrificing that pawn. And I made rook a d1. And then I realized after I made that, oh my goodness, he could just take my pawn on c4. I'm going to lose, you know, that pawn. And I said, boy, that was really unbelievably bad of me. But actually, the engines think that rook ad1 is a pretty good move and that black really shouldn't take the pawn and fall further behind in development. And Sergei agreed with the engines. He thought the queen takes c4 was not his best move. And he was right. He played knight a6. If he does play queen takes here, I have moves like b3 followed by bishop d6 with all kinds of pressure coming up with f3. Um, the engine thinks I'm completely winning there. 
Uh, but it also thinks I'm probably winning after rook a d1. All right, so black plays knight a3. And now, again, I should probably play, let's see, let's check what the engine says I should play here. This is a critical part of the game because I threw away my most of my advantage in this move. Uh, I played um, 92, but Stockfish 14, let's see. Well, Ribka says I should play Bishop H3, or I, or I should play either B3 guarding the pawn, or play Bishop H3 and going after the squares. Uh, instead, I play Knight E2, and now my advantage has dropped from pretty much winning down to just having a nice advantage. So black plays knight b4 and hits my queen. I guard my a2 pawn and my c4 pawn with queen b3. He puts his knight into that nice square d3, but now I can undermine it and go after his light squares with f3. He attacks my c pawn a second time with bishop e6. I take a while and calculate that I can take on e4 first and end up trading the e-pawn for the c-pawn. He plays bishop takes c4, I play queen c2, and now he can't play bishop takes a2 because he loses the knight, and right now I'm threatening rook takes. He could play knight takes on f4, but after I take back with either the rook or the knight, I'm having all this pressure on the f-file on the f5-pawn, so he really doesn't have time to play bishop takes a2. So what he does is he just attacks my queen with the knight, <clears throat> now I have to keep guarding my knight on e2 with my queen. I play queen d2. And here the engine says that he made a mistake. He should play... Let's check what the engine wants him to play here. Engine wants him to play something like maybe, I guess, f takes e4 in this position. Instead, Sergei plays rook a d8. Now, I can't win two rooks for the queen because after I play rook d8, he has bishop takes e2. So I play queen takes b4, and he forks my rooks with bishop e2, but unfortunately for Sergei, I can take his rook, which gives me a big advantage. <clears throat> he takes my rook on f1. We have now a counting sequence. If you haven't seen my earlier videos on counting, this is a very complicated counting sequence with two desperado pieces, his bishop and my rook. <clears throat> so here, I take his, his rook on f8 and attack his queen. He takes my rook and attacks my queen. And now he's threatening to take on e4 and he's threatening to save his bishop. I play the only move which is a winning move. I play queen a5 with a threat of playing queen takes f5 check when he saves his bishop. So for instance, if he plays bishop takes g2, queen takes f5 check, followed by taking on g2. With a completely winning position, I'm up a pawn and my pieces are much, much better placed. So he can't do that, so he plays bishop b5 trying to block my queen from taking this pawn, but of course now I can just take it with a knight and I'm up a clear pawn. So now I'm better. Sergei tries to counterattack with queen here. It's not that he wants to play queen f1. It's that he wants to play queen d4 check followed by queen d1. And I'm in a little bit of trouble. So I play the queen check first. He goes back. And now for the reason I just explained, I can't take the pawn on h6 because he has... If I play like knight h6, bishop h6, bishop h6, threatening mate, he has queen d4 check, king h1, queen d1 check winning. If you don't believe me... Knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, queen checks. I can't put the bishop in the way. I can't play king f1. I have to play here. Queen checks, bishop here, only legal move, checkmate. checkmate. So I can't do that. Okay, so just play out the game real quickly back to that point. All right, so... So here, I decide to take a tempo and just make my king safe from, from that threat. So I play h3 so that my king can duck into h2 and all those checks later after I take the h6 pawn with queen d4 won't amount to anything with king h2. So now I'm threatening to win another pawn and it's really tough for black. So he brings the queen back. 
But now I can trade off into the end game. I check him, forking the king and the queen. He has to take with the bishop. I trade queens. He takes. I take his bishop. And he attacks my e-pawn. I'm up two pawns in the end game with a bishop pair. I attack his knight. His knight goes back and attacks my pawn. I guard the pawn. And Sergei attacks my pawn with the knight and the king. All right, so what should white do here? If white doesn't do anything, he, black's going to take that pawn and white will only be up one pawn and then the win will become much more problematic. So here I found a move that uh, made me think that the game was over. So it, it took me a minute to find this move and once I found it I said, oh, if I play this move, then this game should be an easy win. So see if you can find the move. If you need to, pause the video. So this is kind of white to play and consolidate his position. And the answer is I played bishop f1. All right, so why is this so good? Well, it's because if he wants to win the pawn, he has to trade off all the pieces, and then my extra pass pawn will win easily. So let's show that line. If he moves the bishop, which he did in the game. He played bishop c2, I played check, and now he can't win the pawn. He moves out of the way and I push the pawn. But let's say he tries to win the pawn. Let's do some end game technique here. Let's say he plays bishop takes, king takes, knight takes, bishop takes, king takes, and now I play king e2. All right, well, what's he gonna do here? His king has to kind of stick around these pawns. So let's say he plays king here. And let's say I play king e3. He could play king e5. Well, let's say he doesn't. Let's say he keeps his king over there. Let's say he plays c5. And now I play g4 check. Well, if, I, if he goes king e5, I'm going to keep pushing the pawns. But if he doesn't, let's say he plays king g5. I can bring my king up. He can guard the pawns. And now I can play a move like king to here. Well, let's, let's say he plays b5. Let's say he plays b5 and I play here and he plays here and I play here and he plays here. Now I have to do here is make sure he can't push the pawns. I just play here and what's he going to do? He can't sack the pawn. He can't sack the pawn. If he waits over here, now I can play here. Now that this pawn is here. If, if that pawn wasn't there, if I leave that pawn there and I go king here, then he plays here and he wins because he's got, there's no stopping c3 and he's going to get a queen. That's why I have to play a3 first. a3, king h4, and now I can play here and go after the a pawn. If he plays b4, I just take it. If he plays c3, I just take it. If he plays a5, I could take either pawn. And if he does nothing and he keeps moving his king back and forth, I'll just take off all his pawns. So once I get to a position like this, it's completely over. All right, so that, that's why if we go back to the game, if he plays bishop takes, king takes, knight takes, bishop takes, king takes, king e2, then I think he, Sergei realized that I was good enough that I understood how to win this game. And, you know, he could play it differently, but at some point his king has to come over to the king's side and stop the pawns, and there's no way he can put these pawns in such a way that my king can't get in. You know, we could try different ways. I mean, for instance, suppose he just goes over here now and he doesn't move the pawns at all. And I play over here. Sorry, he plays over here. I play here. He waits. I play here. He plays here. And I play here. Well, his pawns aren't far enough to create a passed pawn. If he plays here, I take and he can't get a passed pawn. And... If he plays over here, I take here. If he tries to push this pawn, I just take here. It's very easy, right? So no matter how he does it, if he trades off the two pieces to win the pawn, he's, he's going to be in a dead loss king and pawn endgame. All right, so he plays bishop c2, and I check. He plays king f5. I play e6, saving the pawn. He plays knight f6. All right, now all I have to do is get my king into the game. Right now, he's, he's defending with a king that's worth four and a quarter, a bishop and a knight that are three and a half each. Four and a quarter and three and a half and three and a half are 
uh, 11 and a quarter. I have the bishop pair. Each bishop is three and a half. That's seven. Half a point for the bishop pair is seven and a half. Three pawns. That's ten and a half. My ten and a half can't beat his like eleven and a quarter. If I don't bring my king up, I can't win. You know, that's an easy way to figure that out. My king's worth four and a quarter, so I have to get my king into the game. So I push the pawn first to tie down his pieces. He starts to bring his king back toward the pawn. I play bishop e5, threatening to remove the guard, take the, the knight, and get a queen. He has to block it with a knight. It's his only move. He can't move the king back, or I'll just take the knight. And now I start to bring my king up so I can help escort the uh, kingside pawns. He attacks my bishop. Notice how my bishops on these consecutive diagonals here create a barrier that his king can't pass through. So his king can't approach my, as long as my bishops are on those barriers, he can't approach my e-pawn with his king. It's one thing you can do with two bishops that you can't do easily with a bishop and a knight or two knights. All right, so he tries to get his, his extra pass pawn rolling to create some sort of counterplay. I start pushing my pawn. He blocks the white squares so the pawns can't come up. I said, okay, no problem. I'll bring the king up and help escort them. He plays bishop h5 to try to reinforce the squares. I play king f4, threatening to trap his bishop with g4. Sergei plays knight to f6 to stop me from playing g4. If I play g4, uh, if he takes with the bishop, I think this would win anyway. If he takes with the bishop, I can take his knight, and he can't take back because I get a queen. He'd have to play like bishop here, and then I get a chance to save my bishop and win. But I had an easier move. I think I saw that. Instead of playing g4, I just played bishop e6, threatening to play g4. And now there's, there's just no defense. If he moves the king to allow the bishop to stop the pawn, see right here, I'm threatening to play g4, winning the bishop. And then after that, I get a queen. So if he plays king to g7, I play g4. And when he saves the bishop, I play g5, winning the knight. And then I'm going to get a queen anyway. So there's no defense. After bishop e6, I'm pretty much winning a piece and getting a queen. So Sergei resigned. All right, so after the game, we were going over the game, and Rich Pariso, who was the master who, I mean, at the time he wasn't a master. Obviously, Sergei was the only master there. But, you know, traditionally, for years and years and years, Rich Pariso was a master. But the ratings were so low when I played this game that, you know, all these people who are masters for their whole life, like Rich Pariso and Leroy Dubeck and so on, they were all high experts. Mike Shahadi, you know, these all guys were all experts. Um, so uh, Rich Pariso comes over. He's the president of my chess club. And I said to him, Mr. Pariso, how did I beat the master? <laughs> and Rich gave me that funny look that he does when you ask him a dumb question. And he said to me, why, you played better, of course. <laughs> Or maybe he said, you played better moves, of course. But I think he said, you played better, of course. So that, that was his answer. And the, the, the corollary to the story is that six months later, there was another tournament at the same hotel, the Warwick Hotel. And there was it's one open section, just like there was in the Liberty Bell. This is the Liberty Bell. And the tournament in, in July was the Keystone State. And again, I was one past the half. And again, Sergei was the top player. And again, I got paired with Sergei in the first round. And I played Sergei again, and he was out for revenge, and I beat him again. And after the second game, Sergei said to me, uh, so what are you going to be doing with yourself? And I said, oh, well, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm doing, uh, spending the summer, you know, kind of relaxing, playing some chess, and then I'm going to be going out to Pasadena to go to Caltech in the fall. And Sergei paid me a nice compliment. He said, what a shame you have to go to school and ruin such a promising chess career. Well, I had only started playing when I was 16. And the first game, this game I showed you, I was 17. And the second time I played Sergei was right around my 18th birthday. And then I went to college, of course, and then I got a job and so on. 
So I started playing at 16. I got to be a 1900 player by that second tournament. I gained about 200 rating points at the Keystone to get up to 1900. And the following year, in my third year of play, I got up to 2000. In those days, that was pretty good. When my rating was 2060, which is by today's standards like, eh, it, I was in the top 25 juniors in the United States. So again, the ratings were a lot lower. A 2060 rating then was really quite a good rating and kind of prestigious. Um, today, uh, in fact, I looked it up. Uh, Jim Tarjan, Grandmaster Tarjan, when he was young, was the top junior when I was on the top 25 list, and his rating was 2384, I think. And today, I, th I don't think his 2384 rating would get him in the top 25 even though he, he, a couple years later, Tarjan was like the third rated player in the United States. So the ratings are just spread out more today. It's not necessarily inflation, it's rating spread. All right, so again, let's go over the game really quick, just to make comments here. Uh, all right, so he surprises me with the Dutch. All I know is the Fianchetto. He plays the Leningrad Dutch. I play knight h3, which is actually not a bad move. I play this unusual maneuver, knight g5, which is actually not the best maneuver, but it's not bad. Sergei doesn't want to trade queens, and now I have a plan to get after his weak light squares on the king's side. And I accidentally leave that pawn hanging, but it turns out it's okay. It's kind of a poison pawn. Sergei realizes that. He doesn't take it. I throw away my advantage with this move, knight e2. Now I break up his center. I trade my c pawn for his e pawn. And now he makes a mistake. Rook a d8 gives me this long combination. Rook takes, bishop takes, rook takes, bishop takes, queen a5 with a winning position. He blocks my queen from taking the pawn with check, but I get to take it anyway. He threatens to mate me if I try to win this pawn, so I stop him with h3. There's other ways to stop him. There's Probably that's not the computer's number one move, but it's good enough. Now he has to go back and play defense, just what I wanted. Now I get a chance to win a pawn and go into the end game. Now I've got the bishop pair and two extra pawns. Looks like he might win a pawn, but I find this really nice move, bishop f1. He can't trade everything off and win a pawn. It's not possible, or it's not, not savable. So he tries to keep the pieces on the board, but now I, I save the pawn. Once I bring the king up, it's going to be all over. King starts to come up. And with this king in the game, it's way too much power on the board. He tries to stop g4. I reinforce it. And for instance, if you don't believe me here, we turn on Stockfish 14. I just downloaded that last week. Uh, Stockfish says I'm up by 9.5. Now he's got it all the way down to 9.4. As he looks deeper, it'll get higher, of course. So at 24 ply, I'm at 9.6, 9.7. You get the idea. So Sergey resigned in that position. Okay, so this was my 201st video. As I said, I wasn't stopping at 200. We're going to keep going and going. I thought this would be an interesting video. And, uh, and next time you play someone who's 600 points higher than you, like Sergey was in this game, you don't say to yourself, oh man, I'm just going to play fast and lose, or I'm not even going to try. You try your best on every move. Who knows what might happen? So that's what happened here. Uh, did I beat an expert the first time I played an expert? No, of course not. I think it took several times to play experts before I beat one. But I did happen to beat a master the first time I played one. So, but I have to tell you, I was never afraid of my opponents, you know. I just go in there and say, hey, it's a chess game. Let's play the best I can. Let's see what happens. If I lose, I lose. If I win, I win. But I'm going to play my best on every move and take my time. That's what I did. This time I got a good result. Hopefully you will too. All right, you can subscribe to the channel, you can like the video, but the best thing you can do, tell your friends about the channel, Dan Heisman Chess, and we'll see you next time. Bye.